morning and welcome back to our lecture series on narrative mode and fiction. Uh, we are discussing tragedy and comic absurdity in novel in the context of uh, Gustav Flaubert's uh, novel uh, Madame Bovary. So, uh, we have talked about Emma's character, Emma that is the central uh, you know uh, figure in this novel around which uh, you know uh, all the happenings go on. In fact, uh, she uh, is uh, she is uh, uh, entering into new ventures and that is how the novel uh, progresses or rather and the novel does not progress because those ventures lead her to nowhere. We have talked about the non-story, we have talked about the non-calendrical uh, uh, temporality uh, where we uh, do not even look at the space where uh, the space that Emma inhabits. It is uh, more of a journey on the inner. I was uh, talking about how uh, the the nature has by the time Flaubert writes the nature has become a bland uh, insipid kind of uh, a presence. Uh, it the nature is a continuation of the ennui, the boredom that represents uh, the the marital relationship between Charles Bovary and Emma Bovary, right? Uh, so, we have had an extended discussion re regarding the unconventional character that Emma uh, posits. So, Flaubert deploys ironic uh, romantic descriptions uh, in order to establish uh, a tension between various uh, characters in this novel, uh, Madame Bovary, um, their experiences of events and the real aspects of life. So, here life is and uh, things are happening, but uh, Flaubert is more interested rather than the happening on the outer Fla Flaubert would be more interested in uh, how these happenings, how these series of events are perceived by the different uh, characters. So, there is this uh, kind of you know uh, each character lends uh, to a given uh, incident their own lens. So, they are looking at the same incident through their own lens. So, for Rodolphe's uh, letter, something that stands for a love letter uh, for uh, Emma, something that stands for a love letter for Emma, which is meant to uh, express uh, you know uh, a more love for Emma, uh, stands for Platonic affection when uh, Charles Bovary is reading it. He has no hint uh, of the kind of uh, relationship that Rodolphe and his own wife uh, share. So, the same thing can be looked at in different ways depending on the position of the character where the character comes from. Uh, so, by combining ironic romanticism uh, with literal realistic narration, uh, Flaubert uh, captures his characters and their struggles uh, more fully in a more well rounded uh, fashion than uh, a strictly literal or a full fledged uh, romantic style would allow. So, he is uh, kind of bringing in both the things an ironic romanticism along with uh, the uh, you know the realistic descriptions to the uh, minute details to the uh, so so we have vivid uh, word pictures word pictures that uh, paint vividly um, about uh, a given setting about a given scene uh, the novel follows uh, the french classical concept of literature where there is a harmonious uh, structuration and the narrative begins uh, we see uh, with some form of uh, some degree of expectation and energy, whereas uh, it ends in dissipation. So, nothing forms, nothing holds for too long. Uh, in the in Madame Bovary, time functions in the form of uh, you know reminiscing uh, past uh, through memories, uh, through dreaming, and uh, the act of 
uh, or, or uh, at the state of being wistful. Uh, so, Ima's forever pensive, uh, wistful mood um, as a getaway from the real social affairs. So, I was talking about uh, being bored of whatever is happening around, especially if it is a provincial setting uh, where Ima, uh, you know, lives. Her immediate surroundings do not arouse any interest in her. So, she is trying to recourse in uh, or, or find interest, identify with the books that she read uh, and uh, in turn, uh, you know, emulate the aristocratic uh, ladies in, in those books. Uh, so, the journey is a psychic journey. She is, uh, you know, psychically detached from her surroundings in a certain sense, right. Uh, so, the blast being blast being uh, saturated about one's immediate uh, cosmos, uh, being uh, uninterested, dispassionate about uh, the mundane affairs going on, going on around uh, Emma. So, protagonist Emma Bovary's uh, first scene itself, the, fir the, the first time the novel introduces her. Uh, we see her looking outside of the window and this signifies her wish uh, to outgrow her frame. Any uh, limited frame, any provincial, uh, you know, parochial frame cannot uh, limit uh, her, her mental scape. Her mental scape uh, exceeds, outgrows the landscape where her where she physically inhabits and, and that is what is symbolized when she is looking out of the window. So, mentally she wants to explore beyond the horizon, beyond whatever can be seen around uh, her through the window. Illusion uh, plays a major motif in the novel. There is this burning desire of pursuing and acquiring something, but uh, even before uh, the, the object of desire concretizes, it is over. So, uh, we see that uh, there is this, uh, you know, transience, this fleeting, roving nature of things. And this roving, fleeting, uh, you know, uh, essence is very well captured through a recurrent image of uh, the melting snow. It is a very beautiful imagery where the snow is uh, there at one point and the next time you see it has melted. The snow is changing its state, so is Emma, right, uh, in, inwardly. In, in the eye of Charles Bovary, she is the housewife, a very domesticated kind of a woman. He has no clue about uh, the, the inner world of Emma, right. Uh, so, the landscape uh, is also without uh, any color, like I said, it is a bland. Uh, uh, land, it is not uh, a green, uh, a green habitation, a green uh, nature that we have around Emma's uh, house. And so, the images are evanescent, they appear for a moment and then the, they, they are gone. You cannot uh, capture them. They are like the, they are, they represent the uh, ideal life that Emma is seeking, that she is trying to capture. So, there is some ecstasy uh, at one point and the next moment you know it is gone uh, and it is uh, it's a mirage of that ecstasy. The love that Emma is forever in search of uh, cannot be uh, grasped enough, right. Uh, so, we see that the, the images transform even before uh, the, the protagonist or the characters realize uh, they are like a chimera, right. The, the sameness, the stiffness of nature that is lifeless without any character, without any, you know, life almost, no vibes. Uh, and this nature scattered lying over a vast span, echo the dreamscape, the, the mind of Emma, right, which is ever expanding, trying to outgrow and the introspective state of uh, Emma and her, uh, you know, 
preoccupied uh, self which is uh, constantly in a state of trance. Uh, now, we have some uh, very effective as a realist uh, Flaubert is very uh, successful. His uh, descriptions are talking about the immediate material reality, but it goes on to become something more than uh, description of the reality itself. Uh, it describes the entire setting, the emotion uh, that the novel carries. The, the emotion, it, it, the, so, so the uh, nature and the character, the, the protagonist psyche are in tandem. Uh, he is trying to say uh, more through these descriptions and this is something we have already uh, examined uh, through, uh, you know, the description of Charles Bovary. The first time we meet Charles in his classroom and his awkwardness which will never go away uh, for the rest of the novel throughout the novel, he is carrying this, you know, uh, cumbersome, awkward, uh, uncouth kind of uh, a bearing, right. It never goes away, he is a shy lad and that is how he remains even as a grown up man. So, uh, through the description of, uh, you know, certain scenes, uh, let me read out uh, a part, I, I quote, uh, a warm wind, uh, a warm wind uh, blew in her face. The melting snow fell drop by drop from the buds to the grass. So, once again the melting snow, the imagery of the melting snow and so the contrast of warm and hot, it is very sensuous. We can see it is uh, sensory, it is sensuous and uh, we find a lot of onomatopoeic words, onomatopoeia referring to you know, uh, describing uh, almost uh, through sound. Through, through appealing to one's sense. We have onomatopoeic words uh, that uh, set up the larger uh, picture. I, it talks about the emotions of the characters too. It speaks to the human psyche. So, images are beautiful, but they are amorphous, they are fleeting and they are constantly changing. The description of the glimmering snow, the melting snow that keeps uh, coming back, which uh, refers, you know, how uh, anything, any possibility of uh, making, of doing, of construing a meaning is undone. It is unmade uh, even before it concretizes, it reaches some sort of final form. Uh, there is a miscarriage, there is a disappointment uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, dominates, that's, that's, uh, that um, dominates uh, as uh, the, the final tone or, or the, the main, um, you know, uh, the mainstay of the novel. Uh, so, the outer and the inner, like I said, the geographical and the psychic uh, shifts are in tandem. While uh, the Bovary uh, couple leave Tostas, uh, there are silhouettes of images, uh, there are horses, figures at uh, horizon uh, that are uh, not uh, defined. And uh, this uh, silhouette, this outline without, uh, you know, much details, it um, resonates with the emptiness, the hollowness of uh, their self, uh, the thoughts and the meaning of uh, their existence or maybe the lack thereof. So, are they taking anything uh, stable and permanent with them from those days? In terms of memories, in terms of relations and identity, the desire for any kind of permanence and perpetuity, perpetuity is uh, constantly flouted, mm, right. Uh, this is uh, also a characteristic of the novel as a, a form, as a genre where um, uh, the entire genre is about experimentation where we do not have any form, formulaic, uh, you know, uh, way, manner of writing, of laying down the novel. Novel does not, does not abide by certain pre-given uh, traits. It is constantly uh, re revising all the traits of earlier genres, earlier novels and that is how it grows. 
in interaction with earlier traditions and yet in defiance of those traditions. Uh, we see that characteristic directly in uh, this novel, right? Uh, even uh, uh, so, so things happening, very simple mundane things happening uh, uh, on the outer, like the statue of the priest, uh, uh, you know, breaks, dismantles at one point. Uh, it, uh, uh, the, the priest uh, statue made up of Paris, uh, dismantles it breaks at a point which uh, refers to the breakdown of the marital contract uh, between Emma and uh, Charles. So, uh, the title of the novel is about this married woman and therein lies the irony. Uh, the woman that is uh, supposed to be designated by her husband's name. So, that is how that is also a commentary on how we identify women traditionally speaking. So, madam is uh, like we most of us know mademoiselle is uh, referred in the French tradition mademoiselle is referred to the uh, unmarried woman whereas madam refers to the married woman. Uh, now, in madam Bovary, Bovary being uh, her husband's surname, Emma is uh, Emma kind of uh, uh, is uh, shrouded, she, is, uh, she disappears and uh, the entire narrative, narrative is about uh, trying to find herself, find her, assert her desire uh, as, as opposed to this domesticated persona that she is uh, uh, supposed to be that she is socially acceptable as. So, the society accepts her as Madame Bovary, she wants to become something more or less than that name. So, uh, the entire plot is about this female protagonist who is struggling and chasing the desire of self through romantic uh, overtures, encounters with a series of men. And the novel defies uh, linearity uh, through recurrence of uh, happenings. There is a circularity in the, uh, if we may use a word like progress, in the progress of the novel. Both. Uh, Charles Bovary's wives uh, die. So, Charles was married uh, before also his wife had died and uh, after the death of uh, each wife, Charles go back, uh, Charles goes back and uh, he touches their things, the things that belong to them. And uh, in another instance, we see Emma and her paramour Leon. A young man that she uh, uh, gets hooked to. Uh, they are uh, in a cab, and uh, it's a very sensuous, uh, you know, scene uh, where the car uh, goes round and round Paris. They, it's not reaching any destination. They they, they uh, want uh, they want to uh, indulge in their erotic excesses within the car, inside the car, and it depicts. The, the pressure that is uh, getting released, right. So, the pressure that, um, that forms out of social expectations uh, or, or the normative uh, image that uh, Emma has to wear around all the time, everything is getting released and uh, the veneer is uh, kind of gone inside the car when she is with Leon. Um, so, this circularity where a cab is not reaching anywhere um, and uh, it carries the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, emotional, sensuous, uh, emotional, sensual, uh, erotic excesses. In, in the, is this narrative progressing to anywhere? It would make the reader ask or is it dealing with large chunks of events that uh, harp a few thi themes? some overarching themes that keep coming back where, uh, you know, lone incidents uh, in their right are not very important, but uh, what is being said through these incidents uh, or the pattern that is being limbed that is being portrayed through these incidents uh, become uh, more significant. Each venture of Emma with uh, a paramour uh, is a chunk of incident uh, which does not take her anywhere. It is not uh, like uh, 
a story that is moving uh, ahead in time. We see these, uh, you know, chunks uh, heaped block after block, one top, one on top of the other. It is not making any progress in the traditional uh, uh, sense of the term we understand. Uh, and uh, in fact, if there is any, in fact, if there is any uh, uh, movement, it is a spiral sort of a movement uh, I read uh, in Emma's journey, where uh, she is moving towards, she is heading for an abysmal pit where uh, she's, uh, she will head on crash, right? So, she is heading for an uh, abysmal pit where she is going to head on crash uh, in the end. As readers, we can anticipate that. So, from domestic city uh, to cab uh, in both places, both in her home and where she is the normative self and in the cab where she is the um, uh, unconventional, socially unacceptable self mistress of an unknown man, of an outsider. Uh, both spaces have shifting suggestions and Emma's sensuality, sexuality cannot be uh, contained either by the space of home or inside the cab. Her excesses as opposed to her husband's inertness, passiveness, unresponsiveness uh, form the torque or the incentive to the novel's plot. That is what takes the novel uh, forward or, or to the next level, if we may. Like Charles's classroom, Emma's experience of visiting a waltz begins with uh, some coordinated movements, some aesthetic dance uh, forms. Uh, and so, some there is some anticipation aroused inside the uh, reader that, uh, you know, the next thing that happens is going to be beautiful, something uh, that, that uh, has a concrete meaning. But after a while, uh, even the walls gets uh, corrupted, it gets disjointed, it does not hold, it falls apart. So, every time the physical delight, the ecstasy, the joyousness is uh, being constituted, is being gathered, it is miscarried after a point, it cannot be uh, maintained. And so, circular, circularity and flouting of a linear journey is also present in Emma going back uh, to ruin every time, a uh, ruin that had witnessed her uh, as a maiden, as an unmarried woman and uh, uh, where she spent her school life uh, and then later she goes uh, there as an adulteress, right. Uh, as a married woman who is uh, betraying, who is uh, kind of, uh, who, who, who cannot keep to the contracts of a marriage and uh, thereby uh, ruin almost witnesses every stage of Emma's life, her transformation through these various stages. And that is where we also find a circular pattern coming in, right. Now, the images, uh, the, the imageries of uh, fiction and uh, dreams uh, follow the pattern of real life. Emma reads the tragic story of Mademoiselle de la Vallée, uh, which pro evokes the image of cracked glass when she is reading the, the tales of um, Mademoiselle de la Vallée. She, uh, she imagines cracked glass, which, uh, uh, which uh, obscures any kind of optical sense, clear optical sense and, and clarity. So, uh, in her dreams also, uh, we see uh, there is no escape. Uh, I mean, her dreams are not ways of escaping uh, the illusion and the ennui, the boredom uh, that, that pervades in the reality around her, but uh, they further trap her within uh, these same feelings of illusion, of, of uh, ennui, right. The dreams are uh, cacophonous with uh, the raving sound of carriage. Uh, so, so, sound images, sound words, sound feelings, onomatopoeia uh, recur throughout the novel. Uh, 
the image of a swan which uh, goes on to become a dying swan and uh, the long dark corridor that Emma dreams about. It is typical, uh, it, it suggests a typical uh, cyclic progression, a cyclic progression comprising the process of waiting, confusion and finally a fiasco, a disappointment and a, disappointment and a miscarriage of all uh, Emma's feelings which lead to a nothingness, a void. So, uh, Flaubert's chronotope, the, the chronotope, the time space where Flaubert sits and writes, writes cannot contain enough the ambience of traditional tragedy. So, so that uh, uh, tragedy is uh, replaced by tragic comedy, tragic comic uh, sense, right, which is characterized by a dismal, uh, incongruous feeling. So, uh, a ludicrousness, uh, 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 a comedy emerging from a sense of, you know, absurdity, a sense of not being out of place. So, comedy can also engender from uh, uh, the fact that a person does not subscribe to the values of uh, her immediate surroundings, um, does not really try to consciously uh, violate them. Uh, but uh, uh, kind of her expectations uh, do not match with the uh, predominant uh, uh, sentiments uh, that, that uh, pervade around her, uh, that uh, dominate the uh, society, the contemporary society. So, tragic comedy that exists at the interface of the self and the society not really a conscious direct conflict or trying to tamper social uh, rules and prescriptions, but uh, a kind of haze where the society cannot understand the individual and vice versa. The interface is not very fruitful, right? And it leads to incongruity, uh, a kind of fragment fragmentation. Uh, so, there is a uh, we see in Flaubert's uh, Mother Bovary, there is this weeping tone, uh, a, a, a very silent weeping tone throughout the narrative that uh, uh, resonates with the larger nature around uh, the unreciprocating, uh, lifeless kind of nature and it gets shriller and uh, it is all over, it is scattered all over the narrative by the time the reader reaches the end. Uh, like the sense of the classroom, uh, like the scene of the classroom and the walls, the mar marriage of uh, marriage of uh, the Bovary couple is also steeped in some tragicomic moments. There is a comic uh, vagueness uh, and even uh, to some extent uh, the, the desire to make the marriage picturesque, which is, which is a timeless desire. Uh, goes on to make it look more vulgar in some sense, where the invitees in the marriage we see, when we look at the feast and the, par the, the marriage uh, uh, party of the Bovary couple, uh, the, the invitees want to look stylish, but they end up looking grotesque. So, at the end of uh, all desires, what awaits is grotesqueness, right. Uh, the, the carnival like situation described uh, as a procession that broke out where there is no discipline, where form, where is, where there is a desire for some form, some meaning, but which is um, that, that meaning constantly slips away, slips out of hand. So, uh, procession which, which is supposed to be, you know, uh, disciplined, uh, it, it becomes chaotic, right. Uh, and people loiter around aimlessly, uh, which refers to a deep seated sense of lethargy. lethargy. Uh, even the feast is so uh, super saturating, so fulsome, uh, it is almost people feel, start uh, feeling nauseous and uh, it becomes repulsive after a while. Uh, it, it is uh, 
there is uh, there are too many things too much of uh, you know dressing and uh, food around the feeling of being sober uh, is gone it is uh, almost uh, it it uh, makes one uh, giddy uh, the way things proceed giddy and nauseous uh, so so uh, there is no uh, you know human control over uh, anything over uh, any uh, such incident which is supposed to uh, work out uh, in a uh, and present itself in a grand fashion the grand goes on to become ugly the the arrangement for the marriage party and marriage feast becomes like i said grotesque fulsome and nauseous nothing forms uh, so marriage is shown as a kind of contrivance a kind of uh, you know endeavor of an artist for an ostensible order right an order that we are and meaning that we are constantly looking for in our society definitive uh, you know meanings telos something that would lead to uh, something else the causality and uh, this falls apart entirely into disorder into chaos and um, meaning is annulled so it starts with a lot of promises lot of anticipations and expectations but end with vulgarity uh, the narrative carries uh, a close intimacy between laughter cruelty and tragedy the letter uh, written by rudolph for example to emma uh, rudolph being one of her uh, paramour uh, is uh, at the same time cruel tragic and yet uh, amid this uh, cruelty and tragedy one also discovers some amount of comic absurdity to it the relationship between rodolph and emma i have already discussed in our earlier class how it is full of lies so rodolph's cruelty makes love the concept of love the idea of some elevated idea of love itself absurd and there is still um, a hint of poignancy attached to this uh, episode uh, the the dead block lies in the reader not knowing how to react whether whether this is a poignant scene or it is a fiasco one should laugh at or or uh, you know it's a lot of uh, cruelty being uh, you know uh, meted out to and a, a a woman who who is unprepared for the reality so emma is an embodiment of desire throughout the novel and she is first introduced uh, against a backdrop of fire which say, which says a lot about her character and uh, the scenes the way she uh, behaves while charles uh, uh, you know looks on they are they are uh, almost uh, uh, they are redolent with uh, a lot of sensoriness uh, emma drinking uh, water or liquor uh, and and very vividly uh, flavia discuss uh, describes uh, illuminates how uh, she she drinks from the cup or from the glass as charles uh, looks on then at a point she pierces a finger with a needle and then uh, she's uh, sucking the blood that uh, you know Uh, comes out of the finger her eye color changing from brown to black and then to blue shows a sign of camouflage and shift and afterwards the blue eye color also goes on to symbolize a poison that she consumes to suicide um i would like to read uh, some parts of the sensuous descri- uh, descriptions of emma which uh, tells us more uh, Uh, about flobius master uh, you know mastery the masterpiece that madam bovary uh, the novel is and which also elaborates uh, more uh, about emma's uh, character we don't have to describe her we just all we have to do is read the the way flobier has uh, portrayed her as she sued uh, she pricked her fingers which she then put to her mouth to suck them uh charles was surprised at the whiteness of her nails they were shiny delicate at the tips more polished than the ivory of tiepe and uh, amen shaped 
Yet her hand was not beautiful, perhaps not white enough and a little hard at the knuckles. Besides, it was too long with no soft inflections in the outlines. Her real beauty was in her eyes. Although brown, they seemed black because of the lashes and her look came at you frankly with a candid boldness. In another part, uh, he says, the daylight that came in by the chimney made velvet of the suit at the back of the fireplace and touched with blue the cold cinders. Between the window and the hearth, Emma was sewing. She wore no fichu. Uh, she wore no fichu. He could see small drops of perspiration on her bare shoulders." Unquote. So this is the level of minute details which adds up very successfully, which add up very successfully to the character that Emma is and the possibilities in her, what she is going to uh, become in the course of the narrative. She is a very sensuous woman, no doubt. Now, Emma's fragile but hard hands, her energetic quality, her candor, her uh, uh, to, to some extent her masculinity, her the hardness about her as uh, you know very uh, strikingly opposed to uh, the the bovine uh, uh, or or the the placid na nature that uh, Charles represents uh, posit her uh, with respect to uh, Flavia's own thoughts. So we could see that through this woman this intractable woman to some extent, uh, this uh, woman that does not give in to social mores. Uh, we have Flavia's own image, Flavia's thoughts uh, in her and uh, her un you know, unconventional uh, attractiveness uh, is could be very well uh, uh, seen as Flavia's alter ego. Uh, a lot of critics actually say that Madame Bovary is Flavia's alter ego, where he is constantly trying to outgrow his immediate surroundings. Romantic literatures are based on time past and Emma recourses to romanticism to seek a vision of ideal relation uh, as is found in Goethe, for example. So, Emma's romantic sentiments lead her to reverie and injudicious uh, gestures such that uh, she is doomed in the end by the time the reality of her uh, you know situation dawns on her and uh, she wakes up to the crisis quite late uh, the crisis that are grounded on a hardcore reality the novel as a genre stands on a historical political premise providing its a legitimacy within the conditions of the contemporary spirit. So, Flavia shows the friction that is taking place when an, that, that takes place when excess romantic zeal cannot come to terms with uh, one's immediate material facts, the doom that is going to follow thereby. Through the romance characters, uh, that she uh, finds in her texts, in her the books she read, Emma explores for the ideal man and lo locates herself in a milieu where she would love to belong. Her journey in seeking a romantic partner is also an introspective journey in search of her inner self, a self uh, that she that is uh, unknown to her. It leads her from the mundane captivity of the present physical reality to a more heterogeneous and meaningless reality and it also paves the path to self-recognition. Through exploring the different dimensions of herself, she is recognizing herself, she is discovering the possibilities of, of herself, an aspect of her that was hitherto concealed from her. So, uh, the union of Charles and Emma through marriage is uh, surely a disappointment while Charles uh, who is a medical officer is symbolic of mediocrity through and through uh, in his profession, in terms of his temperament. Emma aspires for a life in Paris, but uh, she has to settle for something surrogate, a surrogate experience in a similar city. So, uh, this is also novel between what uh, 
life has to give which is a flawed version and what we expect out of life right we are always we have to make do with some uh, vicarious experience some vicarious version of what we want from life uh, and that is for real the friction between the ideal desires and real experience uh, is symptomatic uh, of the novel as a genre now we have the presence of this apothecary called home Homme who starts writing and uh, who prefigures the uprising bourgeois, his dialogue with the priest Monsieur Binet who is a clergyman shows the antagonistic crossing between theocentric ideas and science both of which are rising in Flaubert's immediate society and they uh, kind of cross paths, how interestingly they cross paths. Uh, Homme is a blind force that stands at each turn of Emma's affairs. And without having any idea of what's going on in Emma's life really, he suggests her a way without any deeper understanding, uh, like I said. Uh, so he is like a blind force, turning, standing at each turn, each vital turn of Emma's life. And he is making a suggestion without having any uh, knowledge of how that suggestion speaks to Emma's reality. Uh, so, Flaubert uses a manipulative language for Homme. Uh, he uses a lot of jargon where different voices merge that of the philosopher, uh, the, the man of religion, as well as a scientist. Then we have the figure of Lerox. And so, these figures uh, represent the spirit of the age, it's, it would be very wrong to say that Madame Bovary is completely a breakaway from the spirit of the age. The figure of Lerox is uh, that of a money lender and uh, it forebodes the society that is to come. Uh, it is inspired by the social happenings around uh, Flaubert. He is a polished, uh, you know, calculative, complex uh, person. And he makes uh, obscene gestures to Emma and uh, he is a very shady character because no one knows uh, what his earlier profession was. Right now he is in the story plot, he is a money lender but no one knows about his past. He has a corrosive effect um, and uh, he is further luring Emma uh, to her uh, nadir, to her uh, downfall. And he acts as a hidden force that is uh, eating away, that is gnawing at the base of uh, a society. He, as a moneylender, he acts as a catalyst in putting Emma into perpetual debt and impelling her to suicide in the end. So, I would uh, very quickly talk about, uh, I, I will also talk about the scene of the agricultural fair. Um, that has polyphonic discourses merging where, you know, different layers of voices uh, mingle coupled with the orgy of animals. Once again, the confusion, the chaos uh, prevail. There is a vain oratory factor where uh, once again language fails. These are the themes that keep coming back in Madame Bovary, the road, uh, where, where we see, uh, so we see Rodolphe and the politicians speaking at different levels without comprehending what the other speaks. So, finance, commerce, agriculture, all these topics are brought together. What emerges is a vague or a no communication, the lack of communication. Uh, so, too many things are going on in the fair. No one can hear one another properly and the effect of cacophony is very repulsive in nature. And there is a cloy feeling, there is uh, this uh, cloyness, this um, dissipate feeling that uh, defines uh, the uh, feast in this fair. I quote from the book, the feast was long, noisy, ill served. The guests were so crowded that they could hardly move their elbows and the narrow planks used for forms almost broke down under their weight. They ate hugely. Each one stuffed himself on his own account. Sweat stood on every brow and a whitish steam like the vapour of a stream on an autumn morning floated above the table between the hanging lamps." Unquote. And description of hands are also 
uh, you know, recurrent in Flaubert's writing. Emma's strong hands, um, the haggard labor woman's long suffering, exhausted hands, uh, uh, wrecker. The, so, the imagery of the hand, which uh, goes back to the question of class and the means of production, it also the, the, the labor for writing that uh, Flaubert is undertaking in order to produce this masterpiece also comes in. So, he is go, going back to the means of production and that is uh, from, from there um, the novel is churning out. I would quickly like to read a portion from the book where um, the labor woman Catherine's, uh, Catherine Leroux's hands are being, you know, in the, her entire being is, her, her presence is being uh, dis uh, uh, discussed, being uh, uh, described. A woman, uh, a peasant woman who was given a uh, silver medal for uh, 54 years of service at the farm. I quote, they came forward uh, on the platform a little old woman with timid bearing who seemed to shrink within her poor clothes. On her feet, she wore heavy wooden clogs and from her hips hung a large blue apron. Her pale face framed in a borderless cap was more wrinkled than a withered russet apple. Uh, and from the sleeves of her red jacket looked out two large hands with knotty joints, the dust of barns, the potash of washing the grease of wools had so encrusted, roughened, hardened these that they seemed dirty, although they had been rinsed in clear water. And by dint of long service, they remained half open as if to bear humble witness for themselves for so much suffering endured. Something of monastic rigidity dignified her face, nothing of sadness or of emotion weakened that pale look. In her, con in her constant living with animals, she had caught their dumbness and their calm. It was the first time that she found herself in the midst of so large a company and inwardly scared by the flags, the drums, the gentlemen in frock coats and the order of the counsellor, she stood motionless, not knowing whether to advance or run away, nor why the crowd was pushing her and the jury were smiling at her. Thus stood before uh, these radiant bourgeois, this half century of uh, servitude." Unquote. So, once again communication fails. We are trying to, uh, you know, felicitate a labor woman uh, with a medal, a silver medal and some money that is being given to her. And it is a very self-congratulatory, uh, complacent uh, gesture on the part of the bourgeois people, uh, the prize givers. But she once again cannot construe the grandeur, the, the, the significance of this entire event, this uh, felicitation, the gap between the giver and the taker is a commentary on the social gap, the economic gap. So, uh, this is uh, Flaubert, uh, uh, a master as a realist, a realist writer. I would like to stop my discussion today here and we are going to meet again with another round of discussions. Thank you.